Good morning, everyone. Oh, can you hear me all right? <laughs> it's lovely for me to be back with you in a, here in our service today. I'm joining you in worship. I feel like a, in, a, in a way I'm coming home uh, to worship with people that I, I really have a lot of uh, care for and love for as well. Uh, so today is the fifth Sunday after Trinity. And today in our worship, uh, I wanted to think about, here's some of the things that we're going to be reflecting on. Good morning, Anna. Lovely to see you. Uh, I'm probably going to do that throughout the, the, the service, by the way. I'll probably spot people, and, and if I wave, you know, just give me that little moment of grace uh, uh, if that does happen. Uh, the, the fifth Sunday after Trinity, this is what we're going to be thinking about. We're going to be thinking about our gospel reading from today, where we'll hear a story of two people uh, who seek God's healing. And what we're going to be thinking about in terms of how we apply God's word to our lives today is a very, very strong and yet a very simple thing. Never give up. Never give up. Okay, our opening hymn is hymn number 638. Oh, for a heart to praise my God. service today is morning prayer to you and begins on page 101 of the prayer book and as we come into the presence of God we're going to greet each other so before we start joining in the service I want you to turn around and have a little look and see if there's any anyone in church you haven't seen just yet uh, at this uh, and spoke to just yet and greet them and greet them a uh, happy morning here at church off you go off you do that And don't forget now, we have an organist today, Clifford, and he's hiding behind the curtain. Would you like to give uh, Clifford a good morning as well? Good morning, Clifford. There we go. Okay. Now, we've greeted each other. Now, we're going to greet each other in God's name as we come and worship. The Lord be with you. Beloved in Christ, we come together to offer to Almighty God our worship and praise and thanksgiving, to confess our sins and to receive God's forgiveness to hear his holy word proclaimed, to bring before him our needs and the needs of the world, and to pray that in the power of his spirit we may serve him and know the greatness of his love. Let us confess our sins to God Almighty.
Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault, by what we have done and by what we have failed to do. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us. Forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy on us, pardon and deliver us from all our sins, confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, and keep us in eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O Lord, open our lips. O God, make speed to save us. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. We praise God in the words of our psalm for today, Psalm 130. Uh, you'll find the psalm on page. Hold on a second, there it is. Page 747. And we read the psalm in half verses. Psalm 130, beginning at verse 1. Out of the depths have I cried to you, O Lord. Hear, Lord, hear my voice. If you, Lord, were to mark what is done amiss, but there is forgiveness with you. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits for him. My soul waits for the Lord more than the night watch for the morning. O Israel, wait for the Lord. With him is plenteous redemption. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, this time shall be forever. First reading is from Corinthians 2, chapter 8, being read at verse 7. Now as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in uttermost eagerness, and in our love for you, so we want you to excel also in this gracious undertaking. I do not say this as a command, but I am testing the genuineness of your love against the earnestness of others. For you know the generous act of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. And in this matter I am giving my advice. It is appropriate for you who began this last year not only to do something, but even to desire to do something. Now finish doing it, so that your eagerness may be matched by completing it according to your means. For if the eagerness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. I do not mean that there should be relief for others and pressure on you, but it is a question of a fair balance between your present abundance and their need, so that their abundance may be for your need, in order that there may be a fair balance. As it is written, the one who has much did not have too much and the one who had little did not have too little. This is the word of the Lord. We turn to our hymn books now and to our second hymn, hymn number 630, Blessed are the pure in heart.
Please be seated. A reading from Mark's Gospel, chapter 5, beginning at verse 21. If you want to follow the reading in the Pew Bibles, it's on page 42 of the New Testament section of your Pew Bible. Mark chapter 5, beginning at verse 21. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered around him, and he was by the lake. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue named Jairus came, and when he saw him, fell at his feet and begged him repeatedly, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. So he went with him, and a large crowd followed him and pressed on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for twelve years. She had endured much under many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and she was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus, and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. For she said, If I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. Immediately her hemorrhage stopped, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing in on you. How can you say, who touched me? He looked all round to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him and told him the whole truth. He said to her, daughter, your faith has been made as your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, some people came from the leader's house to say, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, Do not fear. Only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. And when he had entered, he said to them, Why do you make a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. Then he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk about. She was 12 years of age. At this, they were overcome with amazement. He strictly ordered them that no one should know, uh, should know this and told them to give her something to eat. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May I speak in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I hope you don't mind, I'm just going to uh, lead a reflection just here uh, rather than go into the pulpit. Uh, and it's also, I'm very grateful for 
uh, Trevor to sort me out with a lapel mic. I hope it's not going to cause too much trouble with the other microphones. But I'm also grateful that he hasn't given me the one with the Britney Spears ears. Uh, because whenever uh, Trevor, many years ago, was, was, put, was uh, fixing up the radio lapel mic, he got me one with these things that went around your ears. And I thought, this must be what it be, feels like to be Britney Spears. Uh, whenever she's doing a concert. So I'm glad it's, uh, it's the little lapel one where it's, it's joined on and not the Britneys. I want you to imagine just for a moment, and you're going to need to use your imagination really well here, because I want, to, I want you to picture in your own mind a really sunny day. Uh, yeah, yes. It's a really sunny day. It's a sunny morning, actually. It's in the morning time. And the mum has been in town to do her shopping. And she's finished her shopping. And she's just heading home. And she's got bags in both hands as she walks along to the journey home. And beside her is her little boy, little son. And as they're walking along, she sees someone, an acquaintance she hasn't seen for a long time. And she greets her friend. And they stop and they start to talk catching up from the last that they had met. And there beside is a little boy. And at first he's a little bit embarrassed by the conversation because it begins with, look how big he's getting. And doesn't he have his daddy's eyes? So he's a little bit embarrassed whenever he, he's first in the conversation. But then as things move on, he becomes bored. He doesn't want to be there. This, the, he doesn't understand what's going on. So he tugs a little bit at mum's skirt. And mum looks down with, to him very gently and very kindly says, eh, look, just, we're just having a, a short conversation. It's only going to be for a moment. So just be quiet, be kind, and behave. Now for the little boy who hears that, of course, he doesn't know what a moment means. A moment can mean something that could be something really, really long. And so instead of, as the conversations continue, instead of pulling at mum's skirt, he, he starts tugging at her hand. Time to go. And mum gets the message. And a, she bids farewell to her friend, smiles down at her son, lifts the, shop, the, the bags of shopping, and continues to walk home. And beside her, her little boy, skipping along as they head for home. Now... I am sure for all parents uh, in church today that maybe you have a story that's very similar to that. Maybe you can remember something along those lines as a parent. And I can tell you that I remember that story really well because I was the little boy in the story. And I can remember vividly that day. And I can remember uh, leaving Portadown High Street uh, uh, walking with my mum and we stopped just where West Street and Union Street meet for that conversation with my mum's friend. I never forget it and I never forget the feeling I had, uh, that impatience, that sense of a uh, sort of urgency to want to be getting home and not to be stopping and talking. I can remember that feeling. And the reason I'm sharing that story with you today is because every time I read the story of Jairus' daughter, it always transports me back to, to that day. That sense that whenever we were heading home, that that journey was interrupted by a conversation. And that's for me, is that story. As Jairus walks to his home with Jesus, that journey is interrupted. It's interrupted by a conversation. And somehow, in all of that there, I can sense how Jairus would have felt sort of agitated, impatient. Why is this, why is Jesus stopping? So let's explore maybe some of the, the things that are going on within this story. Because there's actually two stories that are happening. There's a story of Jairus, who is a religious leader in the community where he lives. So he's a well-known, well-respected, 
wealthy man living in that community, religious leader, and his daughter is ill to the point of death. So she's terminally ill. And the thought of her death is too much for him to bear. So he goes and he hears that Jesus has arrived uh, just at the shore where the, where the community live. Jesus has traveled across the lake with his disciples. And Jairus goes and finds him and he kneels down before Jesus. And he says, he explains his daughter, his young daughter, is at the point of death. Would he come and pray for her that she would be healed? And Jesus agrees. And he goes with his disciples. And on the way, we're told in Mark's gospel, a big crowd start to walk along. And they're following Jairus and Jesus and the disciples walking through the town to go to Jairus' house. And then we read the second story. So there's a second story in this. And then the second story is a story of a woman who is ill. Now her story is very different. She's not known. We don't even know her name. We don't know what she's called. She has been suffering an illness that she has spent all her money on to try and get a cure. She's seen different doctors, tried different medicines, and still... No, instead of getting better, she's getting worse. She has no more money. All spent. So she's not well known. She's not wealthy. She is an unknown, insignificant woman. She walks in the crowd as if she is invisible. And in her mind, she thinks, if I just touch Jesus' clothes, the hem of his cloak, I will be healed. She thinks that in her own mind. And this is where two stories join. This is where they connect. As, as this woman touches Jesus' cloak, she's healed, and Jesus senses power going from him. And he stops, and he says, who's touched me? And the disciples say, well, you can see all the crowd around here. There's loads of people hustling and bustling around you. Of course, there's loads of people doing it. What are you, why are you asking a question like that? And he said, but someone has touched me, and I could feel power going from me. And this is when we, we hear the woman coming forward, telling Jesus her story, all of the truth of it. And, and then Jesus turns to her and addresses her in that story. Two stories that at the start seem very different, and yet they connect whenever they come to Jesus. They connect at that particular moment. And there are other, there's an, a third person in this story. Someone where we can find some similarities or parallels in the woman's story. Jairus' daughter, she's 12 years old, and she's, she's terminally ill. She's 12 years old. And the woman who comes to Jesus has been ill for 12 years. So we're being encouraged to see a connection. And we'll also see another connection in how Jesus addresses this woman. So, these are the sorts of things, but the thing that really connects all of them is this idea they come to Jesus for healing. They come to Jesus for healing. They believe that Jesus can make the difference. So let's explore it a little bit more to understand what do we learn? What can we learn from these stories? And I think the very first thing that we learn from a, the story from Jairus is that whenever you're seeking God in whatever situation you may be in, you're going to have to be patient, right? You're going to have to be patient because as Jairus is walking along with Jesus and he stops to find the woman who's touched his cloak and has a conversation with her, can you imagine how Jairus is feeling? Every moment is critical here. His daughter is near death. He needs Jesus to come and Jesus has agreed to go and pray for her and to heal her and we're stopped. We're stopped to try and find a woman 
who's unknown and to have a conversation with a complete stranger and Jesus has stopped. And I am sure in his mind that he was frustrated, that he was impatient, that he was agitated because he needed Jesus to get to his home as soon as possible. But he needed to be patient. He had to learn to be patient and to wait for Jesus. The second thing that we learn uh, is from the woman's story. The idea that whenever you seek God in any situation in your life, you need to be ready to be transformed. You need to be ready for that. Because whenever Jesus speaks with her, he calls her daughter. Daughter, he calls her. So this, whenever we're looking at this, it's not just the physical healing of this woman's body, but this is affirmation that Jesus gives her that she's a child of God, a daughter of God. That's the word he uses. You're a child of God, not an unknown woman, not invisible or insignificant. A child of God, a child of God. And he affirms her place, her value in the community where she is. Says that in front of that crowd of people. Says it in front of his own disciples. And says it to Jairus. And what an inspiration. Because I am sure as Jairus is waiting there, all impatient all agitated, that all of a sudden he starts to realize something. This woman didn't ask Jesus to be healed. She didn't ask. She just believed that by touching his, his clothes, the hem of his garment, that she would be healed. Surely God, the Jesus that he had asked, surely he could come and heal his daughter. And because of their faith, God transformed their lives. Thirdly, what we also learn is this idea, and I think it is the most overwhelming of all the things we learn from this story, and it is in that idea, never give up. Never give up. Now, we know this woman never gave up. She tried to go and see lots of different doctors. She tried lots of different medicines, and nothing had worked. And she didn't give up. She went to Jesus for her healing. She didn't give up. And it was through her faith in Jesus that she experienced that healing. But it was in that affirmation of Jesus calling her daughter that she, that she was that affirmation that she was a child of God. But Jairus as well didn't give up. At that point, whenever the woman tells the story, Mark tells us people came from Jairus' house and they told Jairus, it's too late, your daughter's died. Don't worry the teacher any longer. And Jesus turns to him and says, don't fear. Keep faith. Keep believing. In other words, he was saying, don't give up now. Don't give up now. Keep believing. Hold on to your faith. And as we see it, Jairus moves on to his house and he keeps believing. Whilst everything around him is without any hope, even those other people coming out wailing and crying for the loss of the child, everything seems that it's over. There's no hope. It's all gone. It's too late. Jesus says, don't give up. And he brings the mother and the father into the room where her child was, brings three disciples in, holds her by the hand and heals her. Don't give up is what Jesus said to Jairus. 
So what are you and I coming and worship here on this fifth Sunday after Trinity? What do you and I learn from this? What can we apply to our lives today? Well, I think what we need to do is to look at the story. Which parts of the story do you connect with? Do you connect with, the, with Jairus? Or do you connect with a woman? Which part do you connect with? Maybe it's yourself, and maybe you're thinking in your own mind about, about health or a situation or, or feelings or, or a particular circumstance you find yourself in, and you're feeling a, a little bit impatient. You're feeling that you've reached a point and it doesn't feel to be moving anywhere, frustrated and agitated. Or maybe you're uh, like Jairus who's, who's holding his child before God. Holding his child before God. I think what we're learning from God's word today is the words from Jesus. Whatever circumstance we may face as individuals, personal ourselves, or as parents for our own children, we hear these words of encouragement. Don't give up. Don't give up. Don't give up. But be patient. Be patient because if you hold on to your faith, be ready for your life to be transformed. So whatever you face in the coming week, may those words come to your mind of Jesus. Don't be afraid. Keep believing. Don't give up. Amen. We turn to our hymn books now and to hymn number 626, Set Your Troubled Hearts at Rest. standing as we turn to page 112 of our prayer books we reaffirm our christian faith as we join in the words of the apostles creed i believe in god the father almighty creator of heaven and earth i believe in jesus christ god's only son our lord who was conceived by the holy spirit born of the virgin mary suffered under pontius pilate was crucified died and was buried he descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. 
let us pray. We join in the versicles and responses on page 113. Show us your mercy, O Lord. O Lord, save the King. Let your ministers be clothed with righteousness. O Lord, save your people. Give peace in our time, O Lord. O God, may clean our hearts within us. And the collet of today, the fifth Sunday after Trinity. Almighty and everlasting God, by whose Spirit the whole body of the Church is governed and sanctified, hear our prayer, which we offer for all your faithful people, that in their vocation and ministry they may serve you in holiness and truth, to the glory of your name, through our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. We turn to page 114 and to the morning collets. Let's join together in the second collet on the page. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and ever-living God, we give you thanks for bringing us safely to this day. Keep us from falling into sin or running into danger, and in all things guide us to know and do your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. And the fourth collet, let's join together. Heavenly Father, in whom we live and move and have our being, we humbly pray that your Holy Spirit may so guide and govern us that in all the cares and occupations of our daily life, we may never forget your presence, but may remember that we are always walking in your sight, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And we continue in prayer as we bring before God all the thoughts and the concerns of our hearts today. We turn to God, reaching out through our prayers of intercession, lifting up all those near to us, those who are unknown and strangers, trusting that even in our prayers, if we but touch the hem of Christ's garment, that they will be heard. We pray for our world today. We remember many countries who suffer from war and violence. And we remember all people who find themselves caught in the midst of war especially for families uh, caught in conflicts in different nations within our world. Those who have lost loved ones, who've lost their homes and livelihoods. And we pray for those who seek safety and refuge far from home and give thanks to those who welcome and help them. Lord, in your mercy, we pray for uh, all the leaders throughout our world. Uh, we pray for all those who hold power and authority. And at a time of election, we think of our own country. We pray that you would give our leaders wisdom and discernment in all the decisions that they make, that we would see your kingdom come, that we would see your will being done in our world, in our country. Lord, in your mercy. We remember all those before God who are very heavy in our hearts today, who are at the foremost of our thoughts. We think especially for those who are sick today, sick at home or in hospital. We remember those who receive treatment in their homes or in nursing homes. We think too of those recovering from treatment. We think too today 
of all those who grieve the loss of a loved one. Just in a moment of quietness, we name them in our hearts before God in prayer. Lord, in the anxiety and the frustrations of our hearts and in all the troubles that we may face, when everything feels hopeless, we ask that we would find hope in you and in your unfailing love. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. And we pray for ourselves. For all the families who are represented here in worship today, we pray for each other. O Christ, for whom we search, our help when help has failed, give us courage to tell you our need and ask to be made whole, that being touched by you, we may be raised, raised to new life, in the power of your name, Lord, in your mercy. And we join our prayers as one as we join in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Amen. Our offertory hymn, hymn number 553, Jesus, lover of my soul.
just one announcement before uh, we finish our service for today. So next week we have an early start to the service. So parishioners are reminded that our service of morning worship next Sunday, the 7th of July, will commence at the earlier time of 10 a.m. Uh, this change in time is for one week only and the services will resume at their normal time from the 14th of July. Uh, it's been a real pleasure for, for me to come and share with you in worship. A real pleasure to see uh, all, uh, all good old friends and family uh, here at worship today. I want to thank Clifford uh, for playing uh, the organ today, those wonderful hymns uh, that we sang today. I want to thank Trevor uh, for looking after all of the sound. Uh, I'd like to thank our readers for today. I think it was Hazel who read for us today. Uh, thank you so much as well. And thank you for coming uh, to worship with us. Today is the fifth Sunday after Trinity. And in our worship today, we thought of this wonderful words of encouragement from Jesus. Do not be afraid, only believe. In other words, don't give up. So whatever you face in the coming week ahead, I hope those words bring you comfort uh, uh, in those situations, in those moments. Do not fear, only believe. Do not give up. Now we're going to share the words of the grace as we leave church today. So what that means is we don't close our eyes and say it as a prayer. What we do is we turn to each other. We look each other in the eyes if we mean business. And we turn to each other as we share these words. And we turn around the persons behind us. And we might even, for those who can do it, have a little look up in the gallery to all of our brothers and sisters up there. Uh, and uh, don't, uh, Clifford has that. Are you going to pull that curtain across, Clifford? Or are you just going to stay there? But anyway, Clifford's there. Uh, and uh, we're going to share these words as a blessing for each other. We have been in the presence of God here in our worship today, and as we leave those doors, we go home in the continued presence of God. And let's do that as we share the grace with each other. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen. God bless.